We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Todd Salzinger of Blue Elm Investments. Todd, how are you today? Uh, I'm fantastic. How are you doing, Casey? Absolutely Excellent. wonderful. Couldn't be better. It's uh, other than it's 1,000 degrees outside, it seems like. <laughs> and as of this recording, we're dead middle of the summer. And so I guess that's what's to be expected. So anyway, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Todd. I know that you're with Blue Elm Investments and obviously in uh, the real estate business to some degree or to the full degree. But I would like to, low, uh, excuse me, I would like to know a little bit more about you and where you came from and then how you got in, uh, involved in real estate. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, my company's Blue Elm Investments, which I founded a few years back. I spent most of my career working here in the San Francisco Bay Area where I live and working for a variety of Silicon Valley technology companies in finance roles and uh, had always had interest in real estate, but uh, you know, my family wasn't into real estate or any kind of investing. And so it wasn't anything natural or anything I really saw growing up. But um, when I was, you know, over the years, when I was just trying to find uh, different ways about, you know, what are the right ways to invest, I started to learn about things outside the stock market. And uh, back in 2010, 2011, started to listen to podcasts as they were starting to come out. In particular, in the beginning, Robert Helms and Russell Gray from the Real Estate Guys, who actually used to be based close to where I live, started going to those meetups. And through that process, was learning about people who were actually investing in real estate out of state, which yes. was an absolutely crazy idea to me that you could potentially own rental properties thousands of miles from where you live. But through them, I met uh, some people in the Dallas-Fort Worth market who were doing turnkey rentals and did a field trip out there and met brokers and property managers and toured houses and ended up pulling the trigger, buying a few single family homes in Dallas and found out it really could work. You could invest long distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and invest long distance and make big money doing it. I mean, good money doing it as far as returns go. And then, you know, I was a, a much just like you, the same thing was always like, how do these, what do you mean you own real estate in Baton Rouge or, you know, it's like, really? And then as people started, like it started trying to figure through how people invest in real estate with their own IRAs and so forth. I mean, it was just such a, such a intriguing, uh, way to figure it all out. And much like yourself, a lot of the stories I get on this podcast are exactly the, just like that. I mean, everybody's just like, has this aha moment, like what? So yeah, and I had this uh, moment too. I, I had a, one rental property in a couple hours from where I live in California. And okay, so there's that comfort of you can drive by and look at it. But I, would, I remember one week I went and drove by that house and you, know, you can't see anything. You just see that it's not burned down and you drive by. And then about a week yep. after that, I was at a real estate conference in Dallas and I drove by a few of my rental properties there and same thing, drove by the house. So I wasn't going to be able to go inside. They were still standing. And I thought, so it was no different than me driving by a house that I own two hours from where I live compared to a thousand miles. So it, uh, if you've got a good property manager who can take care of the place and you're in a good markets, you can do well. Well, yeah. And it's like, and, and a lot of, a lot's to be said about, about the thing just standing. I mean, you know, it's, there's just as much potential for, but at the same time, when you, somebody tearing that house up and leaving it. And then if you go to somewhere where you have 50 units and you have that same person tear one unit up, now you're only out one unit instead of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And so, yeah, the discussion about, well, the house is standing could go in a thousand different directions. <laughs> yeah, it, it could. Yeah, I did have a, one bad really experience about one of the uh, one of the houses that I had that 
uh, a stripper actually rented the house. So, you know, okay. tenant moved in, turned out she faked a lot of her documents, but paid rent for a couple months and then all of a sudden stopped paying. And after they evicted her, then they went in and she had painted the bedrooms like this dark purple and actually had installed a stripper pole in the master bedroom. Um, oh. That was a little bit of a horror story from a, the, you know, single oh. family home rental situation, but sometimes yeah. you get good tenants. Um, sometimes you don't get good tenants. Yeah. Uh, I like the fact that that was a horror story. I mean, yeah. <laughs> one way or the other, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, strippers got to have somewhere to live too. I, mean, I a, guess so. Uh, yeah. It's uh, so anyway, so yeah, uh, moving on. <laughs> um, but the, you know, and then when you started looking at these things, so, all right, so let me, let me get this right. You had single family rentals where you live or close to where you live. But then you also had some in Dallas. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I actually bought them in Dallas first. And then subsequent to that, there was a house I was living in a, a couple hours away from where I live now that when I moved out, I, I kept that as a rental. Gotcha. So I really started okay. long distance investing. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So, so, so the long distance part you had kind of tackled, um, you just d needed to, to start tackling the growth part of it and saying, Hey, you know, let's put some of this stuff together. So do, what, what did you all do the bulk? What's the bulk of what you do today? Multifamily? Uh, well, yeah. So then I, uh, I, started down that single family path. I think like a lot of people do thinking, Oh, I'm going to have this portfolio of single family homes and re replace my W2 income. And after buying a few houses, I realized, okay, this is going to take a long time to actually get to that point, And I'm going to have to, you know, spend 20, $30,000 for down payments to continue to grow the portfolio. And during that time, I started to discover about real estate syndications also through the real estate guys went to some of their syndication uh, training seminars, uh, joined some other real estate mentoring groups, and decided to launch a syndication business. And that, that's kind of when I founded Blue Elm. And looking uh, at a lot of different asset classes uh, over the years, I decided kind of after different, uh, you know, talking with a lot of different people, reading a lot, listening to podcasts, going to conferences, decided to focus in on mobile home parks for my first two syndications. So I ended up in 2019 acquiring two parks about an hour and a half outside of Georgia and uh, yeah, put together a, a little small syndication. Hang on, Another, an hour and a half outside of what? Uh, oh, Georgia? Sorry, outside of Atlanta. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Missed the Atlanta in part. In a town oh, called uh, a... Milledgeville. Awesome. Okay, yeah. And that's, man, that's really strange because um, that's just not something you hear of generally being that close to Atlanta. Uh, cause a lot of times when I hear of Atlanta, it's, it's, they have a lot of multifamily, a lot of multifamily, but I don't know that. So two mobile home parks just outside of Atlanta. And what year was this? 2019? This was 2019. Said? Yeah. Yeah. So there were two okay, parks. You still own those? Each other. Um, actually, no, actually we just, I just sold them last week. <laughs> so just to. Um, awesome. We held them for a, bit, a little over two and a half years, and uh, just closed escrow. A new new buyer came in. Bought them. How many um, how many uh, pads? I guess is the is the correct term. But how many pads was each one? Yeah, one was forty eight. One was twenty three. So seventy one. Okay, so between the two, medium ish. Yeah, medium to small ish mobile home parks. Right. All right. And what did the uh, what did the final numbers look like at, on the exit? Was obviously you. I'm assuming you probably went north with them. So what did those, what did your final numbers look like? Yeah. So yeah, when we, the good part about the kind of the time we held, it was the, the mobile home park business has continued to grow and there's been a lot more interest in the space. The downside to the acquisition came a lot when we bought it at the end of 2019, leading right into COVID. So, you know, the guy that we bought the park from was only taking cash because he wasn't reporting all the income, we assume. And so we had to convert yeah. the tenants over to not paying cash anymore, uh, which caused some people to leave because they were just used to being that kind of tenant. And then COVID hit, you know, in early 2020. And Georgia, which is typically a landlord friendly state, all of a sudden wasn't. And we yep. couldn't evict people because the eviction courts were closed and there was the moratorium. So we had a long stretch during 2020 and even into 2021 where tenants weren't paying rent. Some because they were, you know, legitimately affected by COVID, other times because they were 
taken advantage of the system. So we did. Oh, now, yeah. I want to die real quick. I want to. Yeah. I want to go into a little area here that I've been in on this show several times, and it's um, it's kind of a it's somewhat market dependent, but it's mostly operator dependent. And I, and I, I get the answer. I'm probably 50, 50 on the question I'm going to ask you. Right. Uh, and the question is, are you, were these, um, were you owned the mobile homes themselves or did you rent the slot for people to put the mobile home? And maybe one was each. I don't know. What, what, what was that? Yeah, it was primarily we owned the homes of the 71 pads. I think there were, 10 people that owned their own house and we rented the lot to them. The rest of the okay. homes that we rented out were, were owned by the uh, owned by us. So then we were renting those out just like you would a single family home or an apartment essentially. Okay. And I, I actually, the guest that was on my show most recently, we discussed this. I, I, I tend to lean towards those being what gives. So there's a, there's, like mobile home parks has always been my thought. And I know that you're, you're in some other asset classes as well, right? Mm -hmm. you, these were just your first two. Okay. Um, mobile home parks in general across the nation are somewhat Bitcoinish in a way where they're almost a shrinking supply because there's very, I guess I'm of the understanding that there's very few munis municipalities that are allowing people to just say, Hey, Come in here and Correct. we'll let you put a mobile home park. As a matter of fact, I don't know of any. And um, the guy that I had on here said, hey, no, I, I take that. I, I'll take you on on that. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, we're putting some in. in uh, I think there was one in Idaho, one in Montana. and But they're more. They, these are more along the lines of, of them. Now, they're having to go into these communities and sell these bad boys, like saying, hey, yeah. we're, we're going to put in a nice mobile home park where these are going to have attached garages. There's going to be a pool. There's going to be a dog park. There's going to be 55 plus mm -hmm. uh, age demographic and so on. Now, so again, we're talking almost, almost a completely different asset class, but the asset class where you own the mobile home is what gives the other asset class of mobile home parks a bad rap. <laughs> it, you know, in often it can, and that's, there's a general stigma against mobile home parks across the country, which is why a lot of them, there's very little development in, in, in any particular year. And, you know, some of it's just because, you know, in, in the same way you might find a poorly run C-class apartment that looks terrible in a certain neighborhood. Sometimes you've got mobile home parks that have been around a long time and, whether it's just kind of neglectful landlords or potentially landlords who have owned the, or, you know, park owners who have owned the property <clears> for 20, 30 years and don't have the resources to fix it up. You know, it might be free and clear. They're making enough income from it where, uh, you know, you got situations where, you know, I can come in with investor money and actually invest and improve the property and increase the NOI. You know, if you've got a 70 year old owner, they're not interested in taking on, taking on half a million dollars, a million dollars in additional debt or try to find investors to improve their park. It just sort of stays the way it does and oftentimes starts to not look great over time. So there is a, yes. overcoming that, that stigma. It can be a big hurdle, especially when trying to convince cities or counties that it would be a great affordable housing option to offer the community. Yeah, and that's what he and I talked about was affordable housing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's that's either afford that that goes that goes in both directions of being affordable housing towards the purchase and act like somebody buying the house to live in, and that also goes the affordable housing route of an affordable rental. I mean, being able to afford rent on something when you have these these other options seems to. Really yeah, it can be a better so place of choice for somebody to live. You know, in some of the markets, like in the, the town in Georgia we were in, the two bedroom apartments might go for eight or nine hundred dollars, and we might rent a two bed, two or three bedroom mobile home for between five fifty and six fifty. So if you've got a, you know, maybe you got a family with two or three kids, they could decide, oh, do I want to live in a two bedroom apartment or a three bedroom mobile home where you know a little bit more room, I have a yard, I can drive right, right up to my house. It's could be a better alternative that's less expensive than an apartment and from a quality of life standpoint might be a better choice for a family. Sure, sure.
Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the assets that you kind of got into after that. Where, where, what did you, what did you kind of get your bearings uh, headed for next? Yeah, well, kind of over the last couple of years, I did, I did the mobile home parks in uh, Georgia, uh, also one in Tennessee in this town called Humboldt, Tennessee. Uh, so I did uh, syndications for both of those. I did a small JV partnership for a park in Arkansas, northern Arkansas, last year. So okay. uh, that was an interesting situation, kind of same thing. An 84-year-old husband and wife had been in the mobile home and mobile home park business for a long time. And they were ready to get out. You know, again, they just were, you know, the guy, the husband in particular loved working. It just was his life, but he finally got to the point where he just didn't want to have to drive to a mobile home park every day and take care of it. So we were able to get a good deal on the property and he carried back financing for us, which is great. So we got good terms from a financing perspective and got tons of stuff thrown in with the park. We, you know, as we were spending more time with him, he's like, yeah, we've got a couple of trucks. You can just have those. Oh, you know, there's a tractor in the property. I'll just throw that in. So we just kind of, you know, because of a situation where you're not dealing with necessarily a big professional operator, sometimes it makes the sale uh, go a little bit more smoothly. So I bought that one last sure, year. Sure. And then um, uh, just a few months ago, I uh, helped raise money for a big apartment portfolio in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Oklahoma City. So I love mobile home parks, uh, but this opportunity came up uh, with some partners I was working with for this big portfolio in the Carolinas, which is just a you know absolutely outstanding market with great job growth and rent growth. So uh, so it really for me, I, I, I'm looking for what's going to be the best kind of risk adjusted return for my investors. And it could be mobile home parks, could be apartments, could be other assets as I look at them. Now you're talking a lot. There's, there's, I heard the word raising capital or raising money for, I've heard that for several of these deals. Now what tell, let's talk a little bit about yeah. capital raising. Um, where do you find new investors? Where do I find new investors? Let me see. Well, I say, you know, because I've been doing this now, I really started the company and started talking to investors about four years ago. It's it's a slow process. It started with, you know, friends yeah. and family and then people that I was working with. And then over time, you know, it's kind of going to more meetups and then giving more presentations at meetups or conferences, talking on podcasts. And then it's just a, it's a slow growth from there where you're talking with people individually and then just building a brand as a company by sending out regular newsletters, posting on LinkedIn and Facebook and getting your name out there where people get to know you. Sure. Yeah. Cause there is a personal, there is a personal element to it for sure. I mean, if you can't get the personal element to it, it's really difficult to get people to come along and say, Hey, here's my money. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, people have to know, like, and trust you kind of as a, as a person, but then also secondarily think, okay, does this person know what they're, can they operate a mobile home park or an apartment? And are they skilled at vetting operators and working with property managers and all those other kind of things that go beyond just, Hey, I like this guy and he's had a long career in finance. So he you know, must have, you know, must be a pretty good guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, all right. Well, so, you mentioned meetups and some other things. So if you're going to these things and are you going to just like hand your card out and say, Hey, call me. I mean, again, cause I think the capital raise the capital raisers that listen to my show anyway, everybody is always looking for that maybe a little different angle or maybe they're just getting started and they're just trying to figure out, Hey, where can I kind of work my way into being like Todd and raise money for so-and-so's deal over here. And that's, I think, where that's I think where a lot of people, the big disconnect happens. Yeah, well, I think the key for me is just, you know, talking to people and explaining what you do and not not trying to do sell them too hard on what you have to offer. Like, you know, I'll go to meetups here locally and some people don't feel comfortable investing out of state or maybe even investing with somebody else. They're just like, Hey, I've got this kind of like California Silicon Valley investing mindset or, uh, you know, a California real estate mindset where that's all they want to do. But I've given presentations about mobile home parks specifically at meetups and 
the people that come up afterwards and want more information, want to learn more, you know, that those are the ones that are good potential investors versus somebody that is definitely not interested in, in an asset class or just wants to invest directly versus investing in syndication. So I think it's just a matter of telling your story to as many people as possible and the ones that your story resonates with and that have an interest will reach out to you. Yeah. And I think eventually they always, and that's what I think, you know, moving in on like social media and then like you said, having a presence where people can approach you and say, Hey, I'd like to learn more about what you do. Or maybe they watch you from afar for six months. And then all of a sudden one day they raise their hand and they're like, Hey, I, uh, I want to learn more from, uh, uh, you taught about, uh, investing in mm-hmm. mobile home parks or how do I find right. a deal or something like that. So, um, now you being in California, where, how did you come across two mobile home parks in Atlanta? Um, well, I actually found them through a broker. There's a broker based in Georgia that has a lot of, does a lot of brokerage in the Southeastern states. And when I was looking, I was looking at brokers. There's a few that are uh, specialized in mobile home parks. Other commercial brokers get listings from time to time. I was looking on LoopNet and Crexy and uh, also talking to a mobile home park consulting company that I hired to help me with my park. So just kind of looking everywhere, made a few offers on parks that didn't get accepted. Somebody beat me out. And then I just ended up finding these ones in Georgia through uh, through a broker. Awesome. Okay. And what was the total purchase price? Of the the total purchase price was eight twenty five. dollars Okay. And you raised... How much? Uh, for that one, it was six hundred thousand dollars. So that was for the down payment, and we also got seller financing on that. So the down payment plus the money that we had set aside for buying some used mobile homes to fill some of the vacant pads that were in the park, as well as for some of the capex and improvements we put in place. Okay, so you it was eight twenty five purchase. You raised six hundred. You put how much down? Uh, Three hundred down. <clears throat> Okay, so so you're 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 six hundred, you're eight twenty five, you're three, so you're eleven, you're one point one two five in, and it's operating right. Yep. Um, I make sure no, no, no. So we were the total right, in was eight eight twenty five. That was the total purchase price. I'm talking about, but, but, but your eight twenty five was your purchase price. And then how much of the how much? Then you yeah. Then you put three hundred right. into it, right? So you were one point one two five in, and you had a full park all rented, except for you said ten houses were, uh, or ten homes were where you just rented the land, and then your cash flowing. And then what what was your exit price? And what did you sell them at? I'm just, you said you just sold them last week, right? Uh, yes, yeah. So the, the the park that when we purchased the park, uh, like I said there were ten pads that were uh, that were rented the space to the people that own their own homes. There were five or six vacant lots, and then about fifty or so homes. And at that time, they were about eighty percent occupied. As I mentioned, when COVID hit, we had people that weren't paying that we had to evict. So our occupancy kind of took a hit going through twenty twenty one. Again, just because we were, people were either, we actually successfully made it through evictions or people ended up leaving when they realized they were going to be evicted. So uh, so anyway, we ended up when we sold the park, occupancy was down to around 45%. Um, Really just, it was solely because of the, you know, people that weren't paying that we uh, had to have move out. And then we had quite a few vacant units after they did move out. And then we just had to slowly kind of go in one by one and, and turn each of those to get them rented again. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. So, so we did have a decreased occupancy. It's uh, kind of trending up now, 
but we got to the point where we were we either knew we were going to have to put more money into the park to really kind of finish out the five-year plan that we had initially projected or potentially look for a buyer. And because the market's been strong in mobile home parks in general and, and Milledgeville is, is a really great market, a uh, buyer came along who saw the potential in it and was going to take it the rest of the way. And we ended up selling it for about $1.4 million. Wow. So y'all did pretty good. I mean, well, you did pretty good on the sale, but then you also had the cash flow from during the, the, the time as well. Well, right? there actually wasn't much cash flow during our whole period because of the eviction moratoriums. Well, you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I keep kind of circling around this deal and it seems like you cut your teeth pretty hard on trying to, I mean, y'all you didn't hit like a massive home run, but it seems like you, you did education. Yeah. I mean, it, it, was, right? it was a good result. I mean, none of us going into it could have imagined that was going to happen. Um, and again, going into a sure. typically landlord friendly state was something we thought would obviously is, is a, is a good thing to do. One of the other things was that Georgia was one of the worst states for getting money allocated to either landlords or tenants. I know I had some friends that had apartments in Texas and they said, oh, we've got rent relief. We got our checks right away. Georgia made it really cumbersome for the landlord and the tenant to try to go through the application process to actually get any money out. And you know, we went through an incredibly long process over six or nine months trying to work with them to actually get money for our tenants and for us. And in the end, couldn't get anything out of them. Yeah, man, that sucks. So, so, good, you know, yeah, so you know, overall, like, you know, good result because you know we we made money on the park. Um, it didn't hit our initial projections really, just because we had a plan to go in, rehab, fill the vacant spots, and increase occupancy. But then once you have tenants not paying for, in some cases, up to eighteen months, it has an effect on cash flow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and especially if and then and then the vacancies at the very end. I mean, you're you're basically sitting there saying, "Hey, I'm willing to sell. So I want to sell some cash flow here," uh, and then there's still the vacancies. And so, yeah, yeah. Man, one of the, one of the but, other good like, things too is that because we own so many of the homes in the park, and the price of new mobile homes and used mobile homes has gone up quite a bit over the last few years. You know, new yeah. homes in particular yes. that you used to be able to get them in three or four weeks, and there were just like six, nine month lead times. $30,000 new mobile homes were now going for 45 or 50. So that was a selling point for us to say that, like, this park is coming with, you know, 55 mobile homes. And maybe those used to be valued at yeah. five or 6,000 a piece. But now because of the market, those are 10 to 15,000 a piece. So those have Yeah, value. considering the supply chain, it put all that stuff back too. Pardon? The supply chain had pushed all of that stuff. I mean, yeah, you know, huge demand for, on those, as more people were getting into the park business where they wanted to fill the vacant spaces. And then, you know, some of the plants had closed down due to COVID. So that just caused this big backup. And then some of the prices for material, steel and other things made the prices go up. Um, so, yeah, so it, it, I think it's gotten a little bit better now and prices are starting to come down a little bit, but they're still a lot higher than they were to buy a new home than they were five or six years ago, which has caused an increase in demand for used homes. Now, let's talk a little bit about your capital raises. You said, let's just specifically, let's talk about, say, Oklahoma City. What did what were those deals? What did those deals look like? I mean, did you end up with a piece of the GP and say, hey, I, my, me, myself and my investors can bring X amount of dollars to your deal, uh, but we want to be on the GP side? Or what? how did you... How does yeah, that because this was such a, a huge deal. So this was with a, a company based out of Austin that has like 100 plus apartments and billions under under management. So uh, myself and a couple other partners went in as essentially a very large general partner. So they were raising okay. to close on the acquisition it was about 40 million total capital raise. And we brought in 5 million as a big limited partner. So we didn't do part of the GP, okay. but because we came in with a, you know, kind of a large amount as one LLC, we were able to negotiate better terms that we could then pass on to our investors. Fund of funds, fund of funds. And in that situation, you know, sometimes, you know, investors might have a choice to go direct to an operator 
in, in this case, this company yeah. had a few individual investors with, that they had long relationships with. But other than that, you just couldn't call them and say, hey, can I go with you direct? So the only way they really had access to get into this deal was if they came through us because we were bringing up. A- yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, it's the same thing. It's just like, if you're going to, I mean, if you're going to buy, I'm just trying to even think of an example. If you're going to buy this calculator sitting on my desk, that's a Casio. I don't go to Casio to buy my calculator, <laughs> right? I go to a distributor. And it's the same scenario, and I think that's why these fund of funds are getting to be so particularly, like, they're going to become a more popular and popular model because the thing is, is that we can get preferential terms that others can't to start with, with an operator. And then number two, you know, we know that the operator is capable. They've been, you know, you've vetted them all through all these processes. And then if the operators would just kind of, come along with us and say, Hey, yeah, guys, you raise the capital over here for our deal. And yeah, we'll go along with you. I just think it's going to be a, for a, for a much better relationship in long term. how I think the syndication. Yeah. And and it's good for the operator too. Cause they think, huh, you know, do I go to present at conferences? Do I hire a new investor relations person or do I just kind of almost outsource that function to, to somebody else who, has the connections that's that's good at doing that work that enjoys doing that and it's much easier for them just to deal with one investor versus 50 or 100 new investors that's right and that's what and then and that's what i've oftentimes said when when people call and and they want to talk about investing in our fund i say you know we are we are basically in the investor relations business that's that's what i do investor relations business I'm not in the, I, somebody's light bulb goes out, they're not calling me. You know, they're calling the operator that we've got preferential terms with because he wanted to deal with one, me, cap. he wanted to deal with one investor, me, and then let me deal with my folks and answer questions and get answers to their questions yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth. So same deal. But all right, awesome, Todd. Listen, we're getting close to running out of time here, but... We have a couple mm-hmm. of questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show. The first question is, what is the best book that you have recently read or are currently reading? Oh, let me see. I think one great book I read uh, over the last year was Who, Not How. Um, this you know book that just talks about instead of thinking like with any task, like how can I do that? <clears throat> the first thought should be who can help me do that, right? With this idea, you're not yep. skilled at everything. You, you know, you've got a certain skill set that you're good at, and there's other people that have their skill sets. How can you find roles and tasks that you can give to those people that'll kind of make them happy and fulfilled, but that'll make your life easier? So I'd, I'd recommend Who Not How. Absolutely. I get that about three or four <laughs> times a week on my show. So yeah, it's 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 beginning, but it, but it's so true. And it's something that so many of us know but it's like until you see it in that black and white, it's like, hmm. I know, I know. And I have a tendency just so, to be a, a doer. So that was just ever that when I read that for the first time and when I go back and look at it, it's just a, you know, knocks me upside the head every time. Every time. That's exactly right. So awesome. What is a dream vacation that you have either taken or hope to take? Uh, let me see. I've been recently watching Stanley Tucci's Italy series where he's traveling through the country. And I swear every episode he goes to, and a lot of times he'll go to smaller regions outside of the big cities. And every single one of those, I think, I want to go to this one outside of Rome. I want to go to this one outside of Venice. So um, there's just like quite a few areas in Italy that I would love to travel to. Yep. And I, and my listeners know my wife and I were there a few months ago and it is just as awesome in person as everything ah, you can imagine. So <laughs> I would I would move it up whatever notches in your <laughs> on your bucket list I would move it north from there because it is absolutely worthwhile uh, the and the thing is is that like all of their I say all of I I say ninety percent of the pasta that you eat there is made on site like made there and everybody has their own carbonara recipe <laughs> carbonara over there is like um, trying to think like America, like grilled cheese in America, you know, but it's got, everybody has their own recipe and it's, oh my gosh, it's so unbelievably good. Yeah. So anyway, 
Awesome. Um, all right. So listen, how can the listeners, if they heard something that resonated with them or they want to learn more about what you know in whether it be mobile home parks or capital raising or whatever, how can they reach out and get Yeah, well, my, again, my company is Blue Elm Investments. So it's www.blueelminvestments.com or Todd, T-O-D-D, at blueelminvestments.com. They can find my phone number on there if they want to sign up, sign up for my investor club where I send out periodic newsletters about what's going on either in the real estate industry or certain aspect asset-specific things. And because I put together typically syndications that allow accredited and non-accredited investors, We'll need to jump on a phone call before we talk about having access to certain deals. So uh, feel free to reach out. If you go to my website too, there's a free download for an ebook that I was involved in called Success Habits of Super Achievers that had, I was joined with uh, Brian Tracy, Darren Hardy, Les Brown, uh, Kyle Wilson, Robert Helms. Quite a few of us collaborated in a book about success habits and tips. So come and check that out. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Todd, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate everything you dropped here. And hopefully the listeners uh, got some value somewhere. If it helps them just get over one little pebble in their way, that's what we're here for. So awesome. And listeners, as always, please go down and leave us a five-star review and type a review so that other folks may know what we talk about here on the Cashflow Pro prior to them coming and also please smash that subscribe button hit smash elbow remember elbow ear eye whatever it takes to push the subscribe button do it please so that you'll be notified as we release new episodes and todd thank you again so much listeners thank you so much for your time and i hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day cash flow pro is hosted by casey brown founder and ceo of 3000 capital a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.